allergies, itchy eyes or skin, cold or sore throat, tummy trouble, aches and pains? Think Pharmacy First. Your local pharmacy is your expert NHS health team treating a wide range of common illnesses and health concerns with no need to visit your GP. Remember, always keep a well-stocked medicine cabinet and order repeat prescriptions in plenty of time. Find your local pharmacy at nhs.uk slash find a pharmacy. NHS, here to help. This is our People podcast, telling the stories behind South Tyneside and Sunderland NHS Foundation Trust. Uh, hello and welcome. My name is Fiona Thompson. I am our Trust's uh, Media and PR Manager and I'm extremely pleased to be uh, joined by Mary Hall and Andrew Hall today and also, as we'll find out a little bit later, Zoom, but we'll introduce one at a time. So Mary, why don't you start us off by telling us a little bit about you and what you do as part of our eye, li- eye clinic liaison service? Thank you, Fiona. Um, so my name is Mary Hall. I'm an eye clinic liaison officer. We're also known as eye care liaison officers. Uh, my history is um, a counselling therapist background. However, I did have quite a journey to, to reach that particular point in my life. I was born severely visually impaired myself, although I did have more sight than I currently do today. Um, I went through the normal education system. I went to the Royal National College for the Blind in Hereford. Um, I then left there and went to London. I actually worked for the RNIB in the latter stages of the 1980s. I then went on to travel Europe for a while. I was a community service volunteer for a disabled student at Loughborough University for a while. I came up to the North East. Um, I was employed by Northumberland University in the research department as an administrator, and I was there for 13 years. Um, I then went on to take a job a bit nearer home um, as I started a family, um, and I was a senior administrator there in a family centre. I then went on to um, work in the NHS and Social Services Department as a temporary worker. I've also been a medical secretary in the local village GP surgery. However, as a temporary worker in the integrated team, I had a sudden loss of sight and therefore because of the, my status as a temporary worker, I wasn't able to remain in the job. So. I had to take a career break, quite a long career break, to assess um, the next chapter in my life, to um, undertake rehabilitation with regards to mobility um, and learn how to do things in a a different way with sight loss. Um, I then got a guide dog and I decided that I would like a substantive career change and I decided to train as a counselling therapist. So I went from literally the bottom, a starter course, all the way up to doing my degree. And I obtained a first class honours degree. Well done. Um, and I did have a, ha- had a lot of involvement with a local sight loss charity who helped me emotionally as well as practically. Um, and I ended up being a volunteer counsellor for them for a couple of years. This opportunity arose um, and I applied for it because I felt I had a lot to offer the post. As well as obviously my counselling skills, I had a shared lived experience that I could offer the patients, empathic understanding and um, I felt I really had something good to bring to the post and here I am now in the post. How long have you done it for? I've actually just, 20th of March will be be my one year anniversary. Oh happy birthday. Thank you. So we're recording this kind of um, kind of where are we slightly into mid-march so um by the by the time it goes out you'll have had your cake yes. to mark your, your <laughs> one year it's fantastic and so your son andrew so andrew why don't you tell us a bit about your background and your role um as a support worker so essentially before this job i've only ever had one other job and that was actually working as an english teacher at a secondary school in durham and kind of my background prior to that point was that i'd done an english literature degree at newcastle uni and that was actually just finishing when lockdown started, so I had a bit of a a year out, and then as soon as lockdown finished in September 2021, I started working in that teaching role, and although it it, it was a very fulfilling two years, it was also quite a stressful two years for me, and by the end of my sort of two-year training contract, I kind of decided it wasn't really for me, and that I thought I'd try something else, but I had no definite plan, and I knew that Mary had been desperately trying to find a support worker to help her in her role. And I thought, well, I'll give it a go. She explained the role to me. And it's actually been even more fulfilling and even more 
interesting than I ever imagined it would be. And essentially, although I don't have that same wealth of experience as Mary, it's still been a really, really rewarding job for me because I still get to meet the patients and sort of prepare any leaflets or information that they need. So I, I, I feel involved even though Mary is the one who is essentially the hero of our service. She's the one that delivers that fantastic service to the patients. But a team effort all the same. Yes, absolutely. And so have you found your um, teaching experience and your degree have kind of played a part in how you do your job? I think certainly from an academic point of view, it's been extremely useful because I suppose the main element of my job is to make notes during the appointment, so sort of live note taking, and being able to sort of summarise things is a big part of that because particularly with some really lovely patients, if you wrote everything down verbatim, you could take up half their files, so it's, it's important to kind of know which are the key bits which will form a part of their file. Yeah. Minute taking is a real skill, I think. As um, somebody who's worked as a reporter previously, I just write everything down, but actually it's a real uh, task to actually just get the key parts, and that's sometimes a really difficult thing to do. Um, and we also have Zoom here, who is having a nice little rest underneath the table in our meeting room. Why don't you tell us a little bit about Zoom? And is, is he your first guide dog? Oh, no, Zoom is actually my second guide dog. Uh, my first guide dog, Dottie, she's at home, she's retired. Oh. Uh, um, she's enjoying her retirement. So uh, I got Zoom kind of over a year ago, just in November over a year ago, um, and he's, he's he's an excellent dog, he's a, he's a big boy compared to my <laughs> first guide dog, but he's very calm, and actually um, quite a lot of the patients find that quite homely, mm. quite soothing, so if we have patients coming in not knowing what to expect, being quite anxious, as soon as they see the dog, I allow the dog, if it's okay with the patients, I allow the dog to go and say hello, because um, I always ask the patient's permission, is it, are they, are they comfortable with the dog being in the office? And most patients aren't. And it instantly almost provides a therapeutic atmosphere for them. Because it's quite a challenge to get a guide dog sometimes, isn't it? It's quite a it process. Is, it is quite a process. I was extremely lucky because my first guide dog hadn't been well um, orthopedically for quite some time. Right. So I was allowed to be put on the list a little bit earlier than I should. So I really only had about four months wait. So I was extremely lucky. So how old is Zoom? Zoom is just over three years old. And so what? What? How old are they when you they come to you? Generally, I know it's different yeah. probably in each time. Generally, they're usually just before the two or just after the two. And uh, how old is he? He is three, just over three, three and a quarter. And what's his favourite toy or treat? Sorry, we need we need know all the facts about Zoom. <laughs> well, his favourite treat is anything. <laughs> Any food whatsoever, and his favourite toy is just is is very open to what he likes. Oh, okay. And what what breed of dog is he? He's a retriever cross. Ah, and are they especially good as guide dogs, breed wise? Well, guide dogs tend to use a um, combination of, of of breeds and singular breeds as well. So my first guide dog, she was a pure lab. Oh. Um, but uh, they do cross um, retriever and labs because of their temperament. So um, you, you can get some quite big. Labradors, but retrievers tend to be a little bit bigger. Ah, right. Okay. But they also, you know, do German Shepherds or um, I think it's Cockapoodles because they don't shed hair. So if you have somebody who has an allergy, oh, I see. So that kind of breed would be, you know, oh, probably oh, better for them. Well, I think Zoom is our first dog. Hopefully not our last dog on the podcast. So uh, I'm very pleased to welcome him and thank you very much for coming in the chat because we're gonna. You, you, first of all, you're going to take us through what your team does, if mm-hmm. that's okay, mm-hmm. and then you can talk a little bit more about your kind of um, your role in it, if that's okay. So, how many people are in your team? So, the, the people in the t- in, in the team for the, this um, for Sunderland and South Tyneside Trust is myself. I'm full time post, and the other full time post is split between Andrea Heard and Kate Jacobovalix. Um, so, Kate works on a Monday, and Andrea works on Tuesday to Friday, and we're based at Sunderland Iron Infirmary. Yes, because the reason why we're here is we really want to kind of talk about all the different services we do at our Sunderland Iron Infirmary, with a view to talking mainly about how exciting our new hospital is going to be. So, we're going to come back to that later on, um, because I know that you know as an organisation you've been involved. Because are you employed by the R and I B? Is that right? Yes, we are. Although we're based at Sunderland Iron Infirmary, we are actually employed by the Royal National Institute of Blind People. Right. Oh. Okay, and so how does our tr- how does that work between us and the trust? Then do we kind of give you support, and how does how's how's the setup? Well, the, the setup is uh, the RNIB and the trust have an excellent relationship. So the trust the trust provides the funding, although we are employed by RNIB, and we obviously we use the trust service 
the Trust actual IT services with regards to the hospital system, but we also have our own system as well. Right. So, for, for example, if a patient came in, we could access a hospital system for documentation, we have the, the, the practical files, um, but we, we would record the outcomes of uh, a patient interaction on the RNIB own system. Right. And that is used for auditing to refer back to the, so that the actual trust, you know, we have some kind of audit paper trail so the trust can see how well the service is, is performing. Okay, so what kind of support do the team offer our patients? Right, so um, the ECLO team offers emotional and practical support. So the practical support could be anything from advice on um, emotional wellbeing, benefits, training, education, um, products for anybody with, with, with sight loss. It really does depend on what, because we tailor our support to the patient's needs. So what, whatever the patient comes with, that's the kind of support we provide for them. It, it's, it's very person-centred. So, you know, we, we listen to the patient, we, we give them confidential space to be heard, empathic understanding, because although, you know, we might, we might indi- sort of indicate some possible concerns that a patient may have, those concerns may not actually be what the person has. Right, okay, got you. So it's very much a tailored service for everybody it who is, comes in. It is, yes. And so and how does that work in practice then, Andrew? So I know that you take notes and things, but I guess you both get to know the patients and build up that relationship and rapport with them? Yeah, absolutely. So part of my job is that I'll go out and actually collect the patient from the waiting room. That's a chance just to say, hello, how, how are you? Um, and some patients, particularly talk they like to tell you the life story between the waiting room and the, the law office. So uh, there's certainly opportunities to talk to them. But then, as well as taking notes, um, I also do a lot of the the online stuff. So Mary does have some fantastic assistive technology on her laptop, which works well with the r b systems. It's not always compatible with every aspect of the NHS system, so that's where I come in. I'll put any of the patient's information that we need onto the system, and also when we get a referral for a patient, I'll give Mary all the information that she needs to then form her judgments about how she's going to tackle that particular appointment. So really, um, it's, it's all about facilitating Mary just by giving everything that she needs. And although, as I said, her assistive technology is fantastic and Mary's fantastic at using everything that's available to her. We often talk about the most efficient use of time. For example, if something that the assistive technology could help Mary to do in five minutes, if I could do that in 30 seconds, then we'll often just say, well, Andrew, could you just read this for me? And then that's how we do it, really. But I think um, we, we, we get by, don't we? Yeah, it works quite yeah. well. Yeah. And so are you the only support worker on the team or are there others as well? In our particular team, yes, we do know one to other support workers at different trusts and different places. But yes, certainly, as sometimes, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, it's just me. Yes. And and so the the team itself, you talk about um, your other uh, team members. Mm-hmm. Do they have very different backgrounds? Do they have their own site issues? Yes. Well, um, there are eight um, echoes scattered around the northeast. Right. Um, five of five of us, including myself, obviously, have site loss. Mm-hmm. Um, and we all come from different backgrounds. We come from um, education, health service, nursing, other community charities, other support services within the RNIB, and obviously we have our service manager, Cathy Burke. Mm. Cathy, yes, she's, uh, she's a, a great help to us in our team as well. She's always really good to talk to about all the different support that you offer. It's mm. always really useful to have a, a quick chat to her. Um, when it comes to the support that you offer our patients, is there a is there something that regularly comes up that, or is every single patient very different? Well, um, as I say, we tell we tell our support to the patient's needs. Uh, while the patient's having a chat, we kind of identify possible areas where we, we could provide support. But then, obviously, it, it really depends on what the support the patient wants because it has to be timely support for the patient when they feel they're ready for it. So, although we could identify an area, the patient may not be ready to to kind of investigate that particular type of support. What what does come up, because we are able to initiate certificate of visual impairments, so obviously that's if if that if the patient meets that criteria, we have that discussion about what that means, how the form works, so the patient has a very informed choice as to whether they want to go ahead with it. Because it it is about informed choice and autonomy. So if the patient it does meet that criteria but doesn't wish to be certified, that's entirely their choice. 
So what does that certificate mean then? Because I have heard about this, but I don't know much about it. Can you explain to our listeners a little bit what, what that is? And mm-hmm. I, I don't know whether it opens doors or whether some people feel a little bit anxious about asking for that certificate? Mm-hmm. Well, a certificate of vision impairment is purely, it's an official form to say a person's sight loss has reached a, a certain criteria. So there are two criteria. There is um, sight impairment, which is classed as partially sighted, or there is severely sight impaired, which is really classed as legally blind. Now, it's important to say that if you're registered severely sight impaired, it doesn't mean that you're going to go totally blind. A lot of our patients do get anxious that that, that's what it means. It it doesn't mean that at all. It just means that you've reached a criteria where your your sight loss is at a point where you could be kind of considered as as legally blind. And so what does that mean in terms of entitlement? What does that, does that help people get... Some yes, support? Um, depending on what criteria you're, you've been you've been certified at. So, if you're certified as, as sight impaired, um, for people over sixty five, you can apply for attendance allowance. It would be, it would entitle you to things like um, disabled persons bus pass if you haven't already got one, uh, disabled persons rail card. I always advocate to all my patients family, friends and carers to, um, when you're out and about, to ask for any financial concessions. If you're certified at the, at the higher level, which is severely sight impaired, this opens the door to slightly more financial um, benefits. So you could apply for, depending on what age, if you're 65 and under, you, you apply for PIP. If you're 65 and over, then it's attendance allowance. So this could mean that you would get the higher rate of attendance allowance. You would get a blind person's tax allowance if you paid tax on anything. You would get a half price TV licence. And obviously, you know, a, a bus pass, a disabled person's real card, slightly more possible benefits and concessions. Um, at a local theatre, you could possibly get a, a carer's half price or free ticket. Well, so, what, what you've gone into there explains what a minefield could be because if you've not got any prior knowledge about how uh, our welfare system works, all these things exactly, and that that is one of the things that you know is a constant thing when we when we talk, when I talk to the patients because it's it's very much need to know basis, you know, and obviously in a situation now where they do need to know, um, and it's it's navigating that minefield we can um, advise them on benefits and sessions. We can refer them to the RIB um, site, loss of, site loss advisors who deal with benefits and sessions. If we have patients who've applied for a benefit and been refused, um, we can uh, um, refer them on to our legal services. If there's a, a case to answer, they will support them in, in battling that decision. Because it can be really hard to navigate these systems because then you know they're not necessarily the easiest ones to get through. But absolutely, and it's as I say, you know, a lot of people don't realise just the amount of support that's out there that the RNIB can provide. We work very closely with local sight loss charities as well. So, you know, if, if it's a matter of somebody having a benefit form and they don't know how to fill it in and they need extra help, we can refer them to um, the local sight loss charities who usually have somebody there that's willing to go and do home visits. So, we, you know, we have a very close working partnership with the local sight loss mm-hmm. charities. And in addition to the patients, do you also help their family members as well? Yes, this service is, is not just for patients, it's for, for families, carers, loved ones, because we, as we know, sight loss has um, a ripple effect. It doesn't just affect the individual, it affects, you know, as I say, family, friends, and it, it's about extending that service to anybody who, you know, has, has experienced or has some difficulties with regards to sight loss. Mm. Um. And what kind of feedback do you get from people once you kind of... I, I guess people get referred to you? Do uh-huh. they get referred to you? Is uh-huh. that how it works? What, what kind of feedback do you get? Do you both get from the people that you work alongside? We get tremendous feedback, to be honest. We do. Um, I can't say I've ever had any negative feedback. Um, you know, people just... Just things like, oh, thank you so much. You know, you've really made a difference. Sometimes I get, you know, patients ringing up just wanting a chat because emotionally they're struggling. So just maybe... All they need is just that empathic understanding, that little bit of time where clinicians um, would love to give them that, but unfortunately because of their time constraints that's something they're not able to offer too often. So we're there to give them that confidential space to talk about things and then if they require something more substantive with regards to emotional well-being, we can refer them on to either the RNIB counselling services or the local sight loss charity counselling services. Excellent. I guess your background as a counsellor must really 
play a big part yes, in that. It, it, it does. I've got to say it does. Um, although we, everybody in the team, um, in the trust team, and across the trusts of the North East, we all have empathic understanding. But sometimes having that shared lived experience does make a little bit of a difference. And what kind of age of patients do you, do you um, tend to, to help? Because again, you're obviously both different generations. Mm. Do what, What's the youngest patients you tend to see and who, I guess you must go up into to quite older people? Right. Um, well, there is quite an age range. Um, we, we do see young patients. I think the youngest I've seen is probably about a year old. Oh. And the oldest is nigh on 100. Ah, right, OK. But I've got to... Um, the majority of the patients are from the ageing population. Right, OK. I was just curious to find out what kind of... What kind of ages you, you deal with? Yeah. I had no idea it was as young as that. Yes. And I guess you must work alongside parents quite a bit as well. Yeah, yes, we do. Um, and when patients, um, when parents come along, obviously, they don't know um, what to expect or things like this. So we can have, obviously, a conversation with them. But, we, you know, we, we will refer on to our um, children's and young, young families support services and they have a massive range of things regarding what benefits education, constructive play with some of the child with sight loss, you know, they really provide a full on service for, for parents and, and loved ones. Uh, so we are very excited about our brand new eye hospital which is going to be opening in Sunderland City Centre in a couple of years time. How have you been involved in um, helping mould those plans? Um, well, the RIB has an excellent relationship with the Trust and we've been quite involved in a lot of the aspects of planning. We've been supporting patient engagement with regards to the planning. We've um, provided technical advice on accessibility and visibly better standards that the RIB would like to see in a in, in, in new build. Um, been an active member of the organisational planning group regarding the new build and we're also providing training for staff prior to the move to the to the new um, new hospital and this enables that everybody who comes to the new hospital will experience a positive good that's positive what we experience want experience of the hospital that's what we want because what is it going to make a difference to you as, as somebody who's been one of our patients and who will work there what difference is our new site going to make to you both so really i think for the patients a big thing is location. Mm. At the moment, the Sunday Night Infirmary, um, which was an absolute fabulous institution of its time, um, isn't very accessible to a lot of our patients, given that a lot of our patients are um, from the older generation. So there's an extra cost there involved in getting the taxis or a loved one bringing them, whereas they're going to be centrally located in, in the middle of Sunderland, where there's, there's next, you know, there's transport, excellent transport links to to the actual building. It will um, it will have state of the art. Yes, because the building rooms. that we have in uh, Queen Anne's Road. It was built kind of around Second World War time. It was, yes. And it's really starting to show yes. that it was built yeah. that long ago, sadly. Um, even um, though it's much loved building, it's just yeah, not yeah. up to standard for what we need now. No, it doesn't meet patient and kind of visitors or even, you know, um, um, clinicians' needs at the moment. The new building will have um, inclusivity. It will have accessibility for all. And that's a big thing. Um, with regards to the actual, actual ECLA service, we're going to be located in a prominent position within the hospital. Ah, so do you know where you're going to be in the hospital? Because I think it's got th- three stories or four stories. I, I believe you know it's, it's on the ground floor, ah. somewhere near the actual main entrance, which obviously gives the service a higher profile. Yeah, because where are you based now with the eye hospital? We're actually based within the optometry department. Ah, so you're on the ground floor there? We are, we are on the ground floor because the entire hospital really a lot of the facilities are on the ground floor yes yes yeah, so there is there is one lift upstairs yes. and there are some services yes. upstairs but the majority mm-hmm. is on the ground floor. i think with the present hospital though um, when it was built we, we you know i think um, accessibility wasn't a consideration so it's very narrow doorways and it's just it's it's time to open a new chapter yeah and it's not the easiest of buildings to navigate no. and i say as somebody who's probably been there about 100 times now and i still get a little bit lost yes. if I take the wrong turn because yes. everything looks the same and yeah. well, the signs is, aren't as This is where the RIB better visibility standards come in, better signage, better colour contrasting, better processes for the patients and, and clinicians Great. to make it a very positive experience. But also when visitors will come to the new hospital, they'll see 
because it's a, it's a new thing, it's a state-of-the-art thing, the commitment, the trust, the council, the NIB is making towards providing a positive environment for, for patients and visitors. Good stuff. And Andrew, what's it like for you to work at our hospital now and how do you think the new building's going to make a difference to, to you and the team? Well, I think really the benefits will be twofold as has been touched upon already. Firstly, I think the location, even just having shops and cafes around, it helps patients who, for example, might get there early and hopefully be seen early. They can then just sort of, if they're getting a taxi or a bus home, they've got a lot more options as to where to spend their time. Or if they're meeting family, who are taking them to the appointments, then sometimes they do just want to go for a coffee to digest everything they've been given in the appointment, which I think would be really, really helpful for them. And certainly, as has also been mentioned in terms of the facilities, I think it will be a lot better as well because um, there is only one lift, for example, which if you're a patient at the complete opposite end of the hospital and then have to try and direct someone to the lift, they've got a network of beige yeah. corridors to navigate. But certainly the current eye infirmary has been an invaluable service to the community and it's remembered extremely fondly by a lot of people who go there and indeed we've had patients who have told us that whole generations of their family yeah. have visited oh, that eye infirmary. Right. Okay. So it really is held in extremely high regards. <laughs> but I think the move to the new eye infirmary will be welcome, especially since the current one seems to have been invented without internet signal in mind because yeah. it's, 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 it's often it's, difficult to get one, yeah. It's not the easiest place sometimes to get online, is it? And have you had quite a lot of um, comments from patients about it? How do they feel about the move? Yes, well, I had, we have, and a lot of patients are hoping that because the present eye hospital has a sense of community. Yes, definitely. And it's been there for quite some time, so for, for, for a lot of people it's a familiar familiar building, mm. um, sense of community, um, that they're hoping that that will continue in the new eye hospital. You know, and I've reassured the patients that it will continue. It just means that everything is fresher, it's newer, everything is state-of-the-art, and it's, it's providing... It's providing the patients and visitors and anybody outside of um, the region the you know the fact that there's a big commitment there. You know, Sunday Night Hospital is is not only regionally but it's nationally renowned for its centre of excellence. We are. We're very proud of that. We should. You should you've done my yeah. job there. Yeah. I was just about to say because we do take a lot of patients not just from our from South Tyneside and Sunderland and no, Gateshead, but. Yeah. You know, from Cumbria, we you know, people travel to our service because it is excellent, uh, yes. and because it's a very yes. specialised service. And sometimes, mm-hmm. so, um, so yes, it'll be much easier for people to to come across yeah. from Cumbria, and you know, it's not too far from the roads yeah. and and yeah. the bus stops and stuff. It will I mean, be. as as working across the trust with my other two colleagues, we we, we although we're based at Sunday Night Firm, we do work across the trust. Ah, so right. We okay. work. Um, I also provide support to clinics in Hartlepool. My oh, colleague right. provides support to clinics in Durham. We're hopefully um looking to get into South Tyneside as well yeah. and have a presence maybe in Sunderland Royal in the not really distant future. Good, that is so good we do to know. work across the trust to support yeah. outreach clinics for, for patients who may find travelling a bit, little bit difficult. Yes, it can be a challenge. And also, um, I know that Tina mentioned in, so Tina Morell, who has been the project manager, has taken us to... Um, has launched this series and uh, she explained how we've created what was called I think you, you say it's a spend area for our oh, guide dogs a spending area yes. so what what will that mean for for people like you who have their own guide dogs to bring well quite often um, taking a guide dog to, to any 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 particular place your first consideration is where can the guide dog spend it's almost like having a child you know what, what, where's the what, nearest loop yes what are the facilities yeah um, but to have a dedicated um, area where you could take your guide dog to, to spend um would mean that it takes a lot of anxiety away for for a patient coming with a guide dog because i guess you need to know it's safe don't you you need to know it's safe um and obviously guide dogs do like to munch on anything <laughs> available <laughs> so you but, know it's going to be a safe area for yeah, him to exactly be. yes good stuff because do, do, how do you know when Zoom needs to go to the loo? That's, I'm curious about that. <laughs> well, um, once you get a guide dog, you kind of you get to know the dog, mm. you build up a relationship, and the dog has certain kind of habits. So, um, so for Zoom, he likes to do it first thing in the morning, right? Then possibly just before we go into work, or if not, lunchtime. So you get to really understand your dog's habits. Um, I mean, there are there are occasions where dogs will just. You know, just decide mm. the desperate. <laughs> yes. 
I got you. Um, so sorry, that was uh, I was always curious about that. So there you go, you've answered my question. Um, and lastly, I just want to finish up by asking what you both enjoyed the most about your roles. Well, for me, I really enjoy the patient interaction um, because it, it, they're not just they're not a patient, they're not a number. You know, it's two people having a conversation, and a lot of patients just need need to have a conversation. Um, so it, maybe I get a patient who's quite anxious about what this all means and you know they may have maybe negative thoughts about or um, you know I'm going to go blind so we're able to provide them with eye care um, information we'll provide them with as much information as they would like we it's never about forcing anything onto the patient and I quite often say to the patient if for instance if they reach the criteria for the certificate of visual impairment I don't I quite often say to the patient you don't have to make a decision today. If you want to go home and think about it, well, and you can contact me whether it's six days or six months down the line, absolutely fine because it's about patient choice. It's about informed choice. Um, so, we, and we quite often have a chat about you know how how they're managing socially with the sight loss, how they're managing on a day to day basis with the sight loss. Are they able to make a cup of tea? You know, financially how they're managing emotionally how they're managing and from that because it's a patient-led assessment through that conversation I could suggest maybe you know if so for instance if they're struggling to make a cup of tea um, struggling socially with mobility we could talk about maybe a sensory support assessment and what that means and how that would work and then if the patient you know would like to go ahead with that I could put referral in if it's a patient that um, is struggling with maybe aids in the home because of frailty. Although it may not be site related, I am able to put um, referrals in for occupational therapy. Because we bridged a gap between health and social care, we're able to look at issues not necessarily related to site loss and you know provide that support or give the patient information about what support is available. And that must be really satisfying to know that you've made a difference in somebody's life, especially if it's you know all the essential things you're talking about, mm. you know, that really do make a difference to somebody's quality of life. Mm. Absolutely, and quite often you know we have family members coming along who um, are struggling with you know with maybe caring for a loved one, and it's important for um, for them to realise this service is for them as well. Yeah. You know, it's an extended service and I always give them a business card. I always make sure the patients are aware that they can ring me for any anything at any time. If you know, if I don't know, know if I can't provide information, I will find out or I'll be able to sign and post them on because we also have close relationships with national sight loss organisations, Retina UK, Glaucoma UK, um the Mac- local macular societies, you know, so we can provide a lot of support and a lot of patients have gone away amazed at the amount of support out there. Yeah. And I will just say there is actually a section on our uh, website stsft.nhs.uk and if you go into our locations then you click on Sunderland Eye Infirmary and then your team have their very own page which you helped me put together which was mm-hmm. fantastic um, and it just details all of the different information that um, is available, all the different help and how to contact you as well so that's yes, probably the yeah. easiest way. I mean I would like to say if anybody has any queries we would you know, prefer that you refer in mm-hmm. because at, le- at least then there may be something we could offer. But if in doubt, please refer. And I guess anybody who goes to the eye infirmary who thinks they might need your help, they just mention you, and and yes. I'm sure that the, the the team there also let people know that you exist. And yeah, absolutely, help them. absolutely, brilliant stuff. And Andrew, why don't you finish us up by saying what you uh, enjoy most about your role? Well, I think certainly meeting the patients is a very rewarding part of the role because although it sounds like a cliche, genuinely no two appointments and no two people are the same. And getting to meet all manner of different people and hear their independent personal experiences is really insightful, actually. And obviously, growing up with Mary as my mother, I kind of got to see firsthand the impact of sight loss. But prior to doing this job, I never got to see exactly how much help is available to people. And even just to play a background role uh, in helping Mary to offer that service is fantastic because we've had patients who come in thinking they just want to sign a form and that's it. And they've left with information on gardening services for the visually impaired, how to get free radio from wireless for the blind, and a whole manner of other things that, before doing this job, I would never have even thought was out there. So it's, it's really been fantastic to learn about all of that support and to help Mary to deliver it, really. Very good. Well, Mary and Andrew, and a very well-behaved Zoom, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thanks for joining us for this episode of Our People Podcast. We hope you enjoyed it and check out our other stories. Hit subscribe to keep up with the latest and catch up with what we've been up to on our Twitter, Facebook and Instagram pages. Just search for our name.